you so much for agreeing to come on my uh, YouTube channel, asking the hard questions, what legacy are we leaving our young? So let me first introduce you as Kevin Impey, the author of Thrive in the Future of Work, the award-winning founder of Work Matters, member of the Labour Market Council in Ireland and founder of WorkWeek, an internationally recognised coaching and mentoring organisation, former partner and director in Willis Towers Watson, where you laid in HR, an associate development faculty member in the IMI and program director of its flagship senior executive program. Finally, chartered fellow of CIPD, served in the top level appointments committee. I'm sure it could go on and on. I am really privileged to talk to you today and thank you for agreeing to give me your precious time. No but uh, I was struck, having read your book, I really was struck by the depth and breadth of your thinking and your future orientation. And one phrase struck me, isn't it also a moral and ethical obligation on all of us to hand over a better world of work to the next generation? And I thought, wow, this ties right in with my thinking, asking the hard questions, what legacy are we leaving our young? So thank you. So would you like to first maybe introduce yourself, what has brought you to this point, give us an overview of your experience and the highlights that were the seed of this thrive in the future of work? Sure, Teresa, and thank you for having me along uh, and it's great, great work you're doing on this channel. So thank you for that. Keep it going. And, um, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, uh, Kevin Impey is my name. Yes, I, my my career started out probably as a science graduate actually, and then got into technology initially, and um, worked then in, in business development with Enterprise Ireland essentially as it was then on a on a contract, and and then uh, I took on a role to help with the startup and manage the startup of a training training and development company. I hadn't a clue about training and development, but I was there from a a business development perspective that's going back mid nineties, um, wow. but that's when I certainly got struck by the sort of the people and leadership uh, aspect of things, and and how we can how how we can influence, if you like, the employee experience and individuals' work experience, etc. So, so that started. That's probably uh, as I say, probably mid nineties. So what maybe you know, thirty years of of experience since then in various roles. And I guess a common denominator of my work um, has been about the sort of the changing world of work and and um, helping leaders, HR organizations, making making work better and making work matter. I guess in in different in different forms. Absolutely. And, um, and yeah, I suppose that that's that of time nineties into the notice gives you an invaluable experience. It's been interesting. Uh, it's been an interesting cool. time. Yeah. And it's a massive backdrop when you hit now 2021 COVID times. Well, it is. And, uh, and I guess one of the reasons, I guess, for the book was, was to just to stop and observe what, what has been going on in this sort of changing world of work. And, and uh, while COVID is the current, I suppose, focus on, on everybody's mind, both how we've dealt with during COVID, but now, of course, how we're going to deal with the world of work after COVID. Sure. Um, I was I was interested in just taking a broader view as to where the world of work has been going, you know, and um, and and where it might be going next, and yeah. and what does that? What are the practical implications for us as individuals in that um, yeah. change, um, yeah. and uh, and for organisations? Because I guess one you know irrefutable fact of of, of the world of work in the last 20, 30, 50 years has been the, the speed of change. You know, uh, the, you know, an external rise of technology, exponential rise of technology as well, mm -hmm. pace of change, frequency of change. And, and you get a kind of sense, certainly even before COVID, you got a sense that, well, all was not right. You know, all was not really great in the world of work or all was not the way it should be or could be, given all the innovation and technology that we yeah. have at our, at our disposal. You kind of seen that there's a lot of, you know, stress in the system, a lot of burnout. There's, you know, income inequality and um, a lot of things going on in the world of work that we probably should be paying more attention to. Um, but the problem is we're so busy <laughs> and there's yeah. such, a, uh, such a challenge on our attention. So, so hence, I just wanted to kind of reflect on, well, you know, where is all this going? You know, where is the world of work going? And, 
And uh, what is the what can we do as individuals to uh, get more control, if you like, of this? And I come from a predominant background in education right up to third level lecturing before I launched into occupational psychology. And I always remark on the disconnect between the worlds of education and business. And really, whatever we do in education translates into what sits in the workplace ultimately. And I think that disconnect has got to be looked at and got to be examined carefully, particularly now at this juncture. They say we can't return to the status quo. It will be an opportunity lost. But, you know, are we ready? Are we getting our children ready? Are we getting the future workforce ready? Is a big thing for me. So at the outset of your work, you quote Charles Handy, the Irish author, philosopher, and organization expert. He says the future is not inevitable. We can influence it if we know what we want it to be. Do we actually know what we want it to be? This is a big conundrum, particularly now as we enter post-COVID times. Yeah, I agree. And I think what was what was behind that idea was, was the sense that if we look even now, we could go back even further, but if we go back, say even 30 years, you know, in terms of the world of work that Charles Handy and others were already forecasting and, and observing. Um, around the 1990s, for instance, was a great sort of age of outsourcing and contracting. And suddenly there was a fragmentation, if you like, of the traditional organizational model going on. Mm -hmm. um, and driven by globalization, cost and efficiency and technology at all stages. Uh, known as the, uh, we refer to it as the Nikeification of work, because Nike was one of those organizations that really took this global fragmentation, outsourcing, contracting. And then, of course, with the digital in 2000s, you saw another wave of, of change, again driven by technology, where things like, and it was referred to as the Uberization of work, which was the idea of work breaking up even further, and things like gig working and talent platforms. And of course, you had robotics and automation and AI happening and developing all the time. And you just got a sense, Teresa, that, that a lot of this change was, was happening really underpinned by technology. But from a corporation's perspective, they were really leading the innovation, which is fantastic. We cannot deny that the, the wonderful innovation and, and uh, creativity and progress that are the brightest and best organizations have done in the world, huge contribution. So but while that's going on, it's, it's like the rest of society is struggling to keep up. And, and uh, the world of education, I think, is, 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 you know, no matter how fast it could evolve and change, is probably going to struggle to keep up. Um, but certainly us as human beings also are kind of going, uh, how do we keep up with this? And indeed, our political system and our other policies, um, which I came across, and certainly the Labour Market Council was, you know, is our social welfare system keeping up, our education system, our revenue system in terms of being... So there's this, as you say, disconnect maybe between the speed at which things are changing and mm -hmm. our supporting structures and models and processes, whether that's education or... or and would you go so far as to say that for the first time ever, man really is face to face with the power of the machine and the power of technology? Well, it's always been thus, though, hasn't it? You know, I, I quote this lovely story back in Elizabethan times when Queen Elizabeth refused the patent on a knitting machine, an automated knitting machine, because she said, hang on a second, if we, if we allow for this knitting machine to happen, what are we going to do with all the craft workers, the labourers who, who are sure. doing and everything else? And, and you know, and, and so we've always had this kind of uh, relationship with technology where it's, we need it and we want it and we welcome it. But then it has this shadow side, you know, or concern. We, we have a bit of concern about what the implications of it is going to be. But you're dead right. I mean, there's something about this phase we've been going in through the last 20 years where that, that is not a linear increase in technology. We're really looking at an exponential uh, change. And so mm -hmm. things like driverless vehicles and all the rest of it and automation is definitely adding to concern about uh, where work, where, where work is going in, in towards the future. So who in fact are the influencers in the zone of decision making, would you say, on a global basis? It's a big, it's a big question, but I guess my, 
my overall sense is in terms of new work at least that the the big corporations and definitely you know technology is definitely you know moving us forward globalization etc and and uh, and the rest of us a little bit struggling to keep up but trying to race ahead so that we can create you know the skills um and we can look at to see the career paths that are available then from yeah. the jobs and the opportunities that are being created by um the the progress of technology and the bigger corporations mm-hmm. is 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 one thing you you see so so definitely you have to say that uh, Corporate life is a huge influencer in terms of the, the direction and, uh, of, of where work is going. Um, my sense would be is that probably need uh, policymakers probably need to step back a little bit to say, okay, that's a reality and that's fine. Um, but uh, do do we need to be observe where other forms of work are going and where our education system is linking up to that new yeah. world of work and um, exert a bit more control? I mean. You have to look at the role of unions and you wonder where they're at as well. And there's definitely an inflection point there, too, in terms of their role. I'd love to see unions, for instance, more involved in things like, well, <clears throat> preserving the sustainability of skills of, of workers sure. who are in work. You know, not just looking historically at terms and conditions all the time, albeit that is important, but actually looking at things like skills development and, and, and sustainability of work. So I think some of the, the corporates are definitely racing ahead. The technologists are racing ahead. I wonder some of those other stakeholders, whether we need to um, just reflect on where we're at in terms of um, yeah, our it's role. A real need. Yeah. yeah, the real need for a reality check, particularly mm-hmm. at government level, and as you say, at union level as well. Sometimes I suppose unions can be accused of being stuck in the traditional mode and not willing to move forward. And that can be to our detriment. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, I think like any profession, like any body, you see both, you see really, really progressive stuff going on. You see unions actually really influencing the employee experience and the sustainability of their jobs and roles and being open to, and I think that's a lesson for all of us, is being open to the realities of what's going on and not sort of, you know, holding on for dear life to a reality that doesn't quite exist anymore, or that will drive the company uh, to the ground. I often thought of an idea for government. Would it be quite futuristic for the, to think that maybe there would be an afternoon every week where they would take a presentation from an organisation or a company or a group of people or a community to present what they're doing to keep up or, you know, new ideas, etc. It would breathe life into government. Yeah, just to keep that fresh. And, and who knows if that's happening behind closed doors. But I, I, I feel that when it comes to actually public policy and public debate, that we're still quite siloed, you know, and certainly in our own country. I've seen better examples abroad, but where it's a little bit more of a holistic issue. So... Um, I've seen German papers, even U.S. papers, and the, yeah. um, you know we have a, a, a report on good work Taylor in the U.K., where at least there's been an attempt to say, look, this is a multifaceted issue. We've got the jobs yeah. agenda for in the future of jobs, fine, uh, future of skills, fine, but we've the other arms and the other legs of of public policy need to kind of line up as well, um, and actually there's a societal there's a societal issue which is. It's not that the institutions can solve for everything. It's like we need a bottom-up approach too, where actually society and individuals are challenged too to rethink some of their expectations and some of, of their assumptions around work and jobs and roles so that they can start to make decisions uh, for, for themselves as well. So it's, it's about taking ownership at a, a local community level and fan us out from that. Yeah. yeah, and just creating these connections, as you say, to, talking to each other to ensure. And there's some wonderful examples of partnerships between education institutions and local industries, creating certificates and qualifications that enable those students to go directly into the jobs. Sure. You know, and you just say, isn't that wonderful to see that sort of that, that both the education establishment is open to what the world of work is looking for, 
and and the the employers are also supportive of of local employment and local local needs. So you know, I just it think was a it's mistake just... to get rid of the apprenticeship, wasn't it? Mm. It was a mistake to get rid of the apprenticeship programs. I know they're coming back now, it's but that back. is injecting life into what you speak yeah. about now, isn't yeah. it? I do think so, uh, Chisa. I think it's really important. I think there's been a a bias, if you like, towards the formal education, you know, get the leaving cert, go to college, you know, get a good job, a professional. There's been a sort of a bias towards those higher end, higher paid knowledge worker type of roles, which are absolutely 100% uh, right and great that people should go that route. But I think, I hope we're seeing a bit more of a recognition um, <clears throat> as we think, see things like burnout and stress and everything else in that in that sort of <clears throat> domain, if you like, of work, people are kind of going, do I want that? You know, would I not be more self-fulfilled um, in a trade or in, a, in, in the arts or in other, sure. in other forms of work? So one of the things I'd love to see, I suppose, in the, in the more 20th, 21st century model of work is, is a rebranding, if you like, of different work types. And that every sure. work type, whether it's in the arts, whether it's a professional accountant, whether it's industry, each of those different kind of modes of work have, have both positives, you know, and negatives. They have upsides and downsides, but they're just different ways of, of getting work done and doing work. And it's whatever you are most fulfilled by that you, you follow that path and that you get access, you get equal opportunity to, to access whatever those different pathways are. Um, and and the notion really of a, a career for life, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if you knew that there would be a, a hybrid of a lot of different types of careers across your lifespan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It would inject life in and increase engagement, uh, move with the seasons of a person's life, mm -hmm. and you know that whole intergenerational learning that can occur as people move through their careers. That's right. Maybe I think that's an untapped well of, of, of um, riches. Yeah, and in fact, to your point, just be by taking a reality check on work and, and, and challenging our assumptions about work that we have all grown up with. And Linda Gratton, of course, has written that book, you know, The Hundred Year Life, and talking about that uh, seasonality, if you like, and, uh, and, you know, finding education. It used to be education, work, retirement, you know, but now it's, it's like, no, I go yeah. back to work and come out. Of, and, and I think an openness, the uh, longer working life as well. We often talk about the needs of the millennials and the younger folks getting into and access to work. But you know, also maybe it's just because of my age, but I'm also conscious too of, of what work and working life looks like, you know, uh, towards, towards the end of your working life or whenever that, whenever that is. And for some that never, that never ends. But the idea, for instance, that, oh, you know, you reach a stage in your career in a professional services firm or something like that, and you kind of go, well, you're either out now because you've got to leave room for others. Well, why can't I go? Why is it not acceptable to go down the ladder as well as up the ladder? And especially yeah. when I could find really fulfilling work, mentoring and coaching people coming through. Um, and, you know, different, again, it's about assumptions. And I think one of the powerful things about COVID um, you know, albeit a tragic human healthcare, but from a work perspective, one of the hopefully good um, legacies from it, from a work perspective, is that it's challenged assumptions. It's it's made us actually rethink. We we've been doing things that we never thought we would be able to do. And I think it gave people time to think. It mm. gave men in particular time to be with family and to see their own family in action alongside their work from the home. Mm -hmm. And I think it gave people time to think, what is it all about? And mm -hmm. what, why has work been such a lead in my life when all of this was going on as well, mm -hmm. family and personal life? And in fact, I would say a lot of people have thrown in the towel and said, no, I'm doing it my own way. Yeah. And I think it's made, us look at, it's made us look at other job types, as I call them, you know, with a fresh pair of advice to say, you know, the, the first responders and the frontline workers and people were so reliant on them and saw those jobs in a different light as well, in terms of the value of them to society and whether or not we are paying them enough and whether they are being rewarded and recognized enough. And again, I, I just come back to that thing again about challenging maybe 
our biases and our assumptions around what, what is good work, what is good work. Um, and how do we make work better? How do we make work matter? How do we make work accessible? Um, and equally valid, if you like, across a number of different uh, domains. Uh, and then look at our education system, our, our social welfare system, our taxation system as being supporting enablers for that. Um, and not, I think we're still a little bit, when I look across our public system, I still think there's this, um, uh, if you like, bias or assumption that it's nine to five, Monday to Friday, and it's a professional type. You know, it, it still has that sort of bias about it. And that is one of my one of my questions actually towards the end, and I, I bring it forward now. How can a nine to five, a dependable, pensionable job type mindset that is in Dahl Aaron, how can it pivot to change and embrace what is now an opportunity? <clears throat> I, one of the things I've just talk, talked about in my book when I talk about the societal response to all of this is the idea of some kind of future of work, uh, almost mm -hmm. citizens' assembly type of kind of, uh, you know, um, forum. But it's, the, it's the value we get from work. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I look at people when they hit into their 50s and they're taking retirement and embracing early retirement. And I always think retirement kills in many ways, on many levels. You know, uh, all of this expertise and this experience and all that can be shared and should be shared mm. through mentoring and coaching, etc., is lost. Mm. Yeah, or, it's, it's, or isn't supported, it's, isn't encouraged. There's no formal formal pathways around some of that too. So, as I say, yeah, I think just like there's apprenticeship kind of pathways and everything else, there should be also pathways for well, what can I do maybe later on in life and 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 to to help people. I think that. One of the kind of objectives around I had on, on this book was that we we start to really set a standard for us as a wider society that it work we should be thriving in the world of work, not just coping. And I just feel that there's been a lot of coping going on um, as we lurch from one weekend to the other or we lurch from you know one crisis to another. It feels like... Um, Work is just a bit of a drudge and it's a necessary evil almost. Um, and, and, and that there hasn't been um, enough uh, enjoyment, engagement and satisfaction in work because, you know. I think we fail to draw the connections between the personal, the professional and the organisational and are inextricably linked. Mm. And, you know, if I, I'm, I'm designing a course at the minute, um, Wired for Success, knowing me understanding you. I mean, we bring our whole selves to the workplace. And unless we get that balance and that self-awareness right, you know, we're, we're not going to get it right in the workplace and in life and in the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you speak a lot though, about the word agility. It seems to pop up repeatedly, particularly in, in the vernacular since 2020. And you refer to four dimensions of agility across four different settings a strategy, organization, leader, and the individual. How do you define agility? Mm. Well, it, you know, you say so you've hit on one of the very important points there. I, so if I go back a step on why I, I pick on agility, um, it took some time out to really study this and work through this in terms of what are the practical implications of future of work, this thing called future of work. And, and the first thing, of course, you discover when you look at future of work, there's no such thing. It's just a, a label of convenience that's used to capture so many topics from robotics to generations, et cetera. But when you strip it all back, there's three dimensions to it. Um, it's, it's like a fusion. The future of work is like a fusion between business adaptability, um, yeah. organizational agility, our ability to be able to look internally to mobilize resources to and pivot resources as needed and the changing nature of work and the workplace. So for me, that kind of is a start because future of work, I get kind of annoyed when I see future of work. Well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What, what problem are you trying to solve for? What specifically? Yeah. So the fusion of business adaptability, organizational agility, and the changing nature of work and workplace at least gives you a a couple of things to grab hold of and work with, oh, right? Absolutely. Evaluate yourself as an organization as to where you are on those three things. And 
And, I, and when you look particularly at the human and organizational implications or necessities for all of this change, increase in technology, et cetera, compl uh, increased complexity, you always end up, the roads always end up with this need for agility. And, and I know it's kind of very, you know, passe, but it, it's, it, for me, it's an interesting one because, uh, and call it adaptability, call it flexibility, whatever you want, but agility, if we could solve for agility, if we could understand agility more and make it as a more proactive, deliberate capability, uh, rather than a responsive, reactive, kind of almost ad hoc quality that we rely on from one crisis mm -hmm. to another, if it could be that more proactive, positive, growth oriented quality or capability, we would be doing a lot to prepare ourselves for whatever change comes, oh. because we don't know what changes are going to come. We don't know where the world is, is going to be and what the next... I suppose really getting. the pivot that some businesses and even the world of education had to take within a week Yep, turn around and That's change it. from face to face to online delivery. That's, That's an example of agility. It's an example, and there's tons. As the human race, we have been masters of agility. We are still here. We have been, yeah. look at the vaccine, for goodness sake. I mean, it's incredible. So our ability and our ingenuity to be able to deal with um, adversity, crisis, and opportunity, um, but my sort of my my contention is that when it comes to the inherent qualities of of agility, it's almost like when something happens, it's more of a reactive quality rather than a proactive. Fire brigade stuff. Fire brigade stuff. Just yeah. And so, but I would love my wish would be that if we understood more about the uh, ingredients of agility at individual level, we would be ourselves more um, enabled, more positioned. Uh, more centered in being able to deal with change and not to fear it, but actually to embrace it, to mm -hmm. take it on, to be open to it. Um, and that's that's why I wanted to kind of tackle the agility challenge. And it is a paradox because you asked about definition and people will talk about, I think it's McKinsey who say, oh, it's a, a balance between stability and flexibility. And, you know, they're right, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily get me further uh, oh. in terms of what it means for me. It strikes me that it's something that we need to instill in our young from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, and it won't have variance to the notion of the, of the snowflake generation. And, you know, this uh, employers now decry the loss of soft skills, human skills, among yeah. the young entering the workplace. Yeah, and that's where... That's you... a problem for the future. Yeah, and then you referred to it in your in your your points and your passion for the world of education. I mean, you look at a child, you know, playing in the sandpit and what they're doing in terms of agility and innovation and all of that. They have it naturally. We have it, but then we go into maybe a school system then, and, and with obvious exceptions, the general thing is to move through a curriculum and you know to come out with a bunch of points at the yeah. end. There's and, a certain um, loss in the education system when you look at it like that. You know, and I think so. I, I think and I think there's great opportunities, obviously, in things like transition year to do this more mindfully. But but I do feel that the world of um, the the value of experiential learning and personal agility and resilience, if we could somehow fuse those in more formally and and, and create space and opportunity um, for them, so that by the end of my you know by the time I'm eighteen, I'm actually. I have an inner confidence, I have an inner resilience, I have an inner, and my mind is now open to, to, to the fact that edu my education will last forever, that I'm going to have to maybe let go of some realities and norms and assumptions I made only, you know, a while ago, that this kind of idea of openness and agility, I think, at an individual level would serve mm -hmm. as well, I think. And learning across the lifespan, that openness to learning yeah. across the lifespan. Now, in chapter three of your book, you talk about the agile mindset. So where do we start? For instance, in educating our young, the, uh, what, can we, what can we do to adapt a mental learning attitude which is oriented towards change and the complexity and uncertainty that exponential change brings? So you've got the intellectually abled. They'll always get on. But we see a rise 
and special needs in today's schools, not alone in Ireland, it's across the world. We see a rise in autism, we see a rise in special units built alongside schools, etc. So that notion of agile mindset placed in that environment, how do we achieve it? Yeah, so, so this is the important factor because one of the things in breaking agility down to an individual level, um, I probably, you know, like others fall into the trap of saying, well, actually there's, a, there's three or four skills there. And if we learn those skills, we'll be fine. And we'll be, yeah. and, and, and there's a temptation to think we can just teach and, and, and learn these skills. And I think that's true. I think there are skills that we can learn and practices, even more important, that we can practice and make agility a daily practice rather than a, a, a theoretical thing. But ahead of practice, practices and skills, the, the work just clearly kind of points to when you look at examples of people who are thriving in this kind of changing environment. Yeah. The importance of mindset, in other words, just that I am comfortable I have a mental inclination and an orientation that accepts the fact that I've got to be open to change, to diverse opinion and experience. Sure. That just because I'm the smartest and I got X points or that I got this, you know, education, that doesn't give me a right or a privilege to know no better in a certain circumstance. If I'm if I'm you know open to embracing change rather than trying to control it and contain it, if I'm being purpose-led, if you like, yeah. um, rather than being driven by a corporate goal or just a metric only. So, so I've described in the book sort of some of the qualities, some of the attributes of what an agile mindset looks like. Um, and I've given some examples, even the way uh, somebody might respond to a particular situation. I think I gave a, a couple of examples. One was, yeah. you know, you, you, you look at it, somebody who gets a professional sports person who gets a really bad injury. What's their mental... Uh, reactive response to that is oh my god this is terrible my career is over or i accept the reality of it and i start to say actually this is going to be an opportunity to sure. work on other things in my in, in my physiology or whatever to make me better when i come out of it i gave an example of a of a lady i, I talked to in the research who uh, was working with a technology company and uh, she was telling me about the project that she was on. She was part of this working group, the purpose of which was to automate her own job, her job. Wow. So, and I was kind of guy, I said she was very, very, you know, uh, positive. And I said, any, any downside you see <laughs> in this work? And she said, look, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's fascinating. It's, it's my, my particular discipline. It's really interesting to see where, tech, where it's going in the future and yeah. where technology is coming in. She says, if I, I've got this opportunity to be involved in that transition, um, not be a victim of it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I will take the learning from that and I will, I will progress either with that discipline or I'll be moving to others. Yeah, something else. Yeah. And for me, that was just an example, Teresa, of what we mean by yeah. mindset. Yeah, yeah. And, and I refer to the, the level of special needs at the minute going through the system. But they have to come out and find a space in the work world. So agility on an organizational level is the openness of mind to embrace these. The and there's, there's some fantastic autistic people who have islands of intelligence in particular areas, and they're a great asset in the workplace. There, there's that's a good examples of that. Mind as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah, I, 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 I remember it was uh, talking with uh, folks in the Office of Government Procurement Action. They were talking about their program and how they're embracing that, uh, those skills. Um, and just how they need to make tweaks uh, to the workplace uh, in order for that, uh, you know, those needs to be accommodated. Yeah. Um, but it was just such an openness. And then the, the upside was this amazing productivity or contribution, et cetera. Um, so I think, and I'd hope we're getting better at that, um, but I think it comes back to this need for us not to be driven by circumstances in terms of the world of work that is going on. We kind of at policy and everything level, we need to stand back and say, look, you have this diversity going on. You have these special needs going on. You've got these soft skills that are required. You've got this rebranding of work required. What can we do at a more holistic level to make sure that we call in those employers and we call in those organizations to say, listen, you're not 
your, your role is critical, but you've got to accommodate what's going on in wider society. And uh, one hope I have actually is that the sort of ESG agenda is, is yes. there, you know, where I think investors and uh, funders are beginning to take up in boardrooms are beginning to take attention, more attention to sustainability, not just from a climate point of view, but also from where, what's our responsibility to ensure we, you know, we, we future-proof people's skills that we're contributing to a wider movement in society. I note that in your, in your work there, uh, when you were speaking about the ESG, the Environmental, Social and Governance, uh, it really struck me. Why? By 2029, as a workforce strategy, as a, the ESG as a workforce strategy, as a factor of decision making of millennials, Generation Z, and Gen Alpha, who will account for 70% of the workforce by 2029. Yeah. Well, how do you see that impact on sustainability? Oh, yeah. Well, just look at the reputation in the future. Yeah. Well, you think you look at what our young folks have been going through now for the last two years, you see all the climate change that's, that's going on in front of them. You know, you see. The, the debate about the future of work that's unfolding right in front of them. Um, you, you, you see what, the, you know, their, their views, their very vocal views about what they want to see in the world of work, what they don't want to see. So you kind of go, well, and I can already see it actually, if I look and I compare some of my leadership and management development work, you know, yeah. of maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, versus what leaders and managers are, are concerned with now, um, they're much more tuned into, um, their, their more holistic role around people development, uh, bringing people on engagement than maybe they were, you know, 10, 15 years ago when it was about yeah. getting a strategy done, getting work done. Um, uh, resource. I was reading a DDI report recently from America, and it's one of the largest um, uh, analysis of leadership for the future. And they say the leadership bench is really reducing, that people are suffering from burnout. Yeah. But in, in another report I read, they interviewed the uh, Generation Z, etc., asking what do they want in the future. They wanted to be listened to. They wanted more education on emotional intelligence. And they wanted part of the decision-making process. Yeah, yeah, and, it, yeah. and it's, it's, it's almost like um, you know, Dan Pink talks about the mastery, autonomy, you know, and, and purpose, yeah. you know, the, uh, you, you, you can see those issues coming up all the time. It was interesting in my um, work as well on personal agility uh, in the research, what came through were things like qualities like learning mindset, uh, resilience, change orientation, collaboration, relationship management, handling conflict, yeah. diversity, teamwork skills, things that you might expect uh, came through. But one of the underlying uh, driving uh, qualities that came through was what we call purposefulness. In other words, when we looked at examples of uh, individuals who were displaying personal agility, a bit like that uh, lady I was talking to just a while ago, about a while ago, um, what each of those individual cases, they were being driven by a, an inner sense of kind of purpose and meaning and, and, and assurance about what they were about. Yes what they were looking to do, the impact that they were trying to make within the sphere of influence that they had at that time, within that job, that role, that organization. They sure. were thriving on that. They were tuned into that. They were uh, looking to uh, base all their day-to-day -day work against a higher, you know, a higher purpose. A higher principle. Hmm? Yeah, a higher principle. Yeah. But yeah. Isn't it so important in terms of a, the organization that these people are given the space to make their mark. Think about that. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people a, decry the fact that they're they're not given space to grow with their talent and to use their talent in the workplace. And yeah. there's a there's a great loss in that, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's that's exactly it. And it was like this this space or this, this sense making that they had made and this self leadership, if you like, that they had, um, gave them a fuel, gave them a, it gave them a driving force then, if you like, um, or even a, a, a compass as well, to, to deal with things like adversity, to deal with change, to deal with 
uh, you know, uh, just unexpected things that pop up because they were quite purposeful. They were able to deal, they were able to use those other skills like learning and collaboration. But the company, the organization that they had, and we talk about an individual domain and a social domain, and the, the idea that, okay, to be purposeful, to be mindful, deliberate about what I'm doing, um, requires an environment where that is encouraged and developed yeah, and, 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 and okay, if you like, yeah. rather than, oh, forget your purpose and your what you want to do, just yeah. get the job done, okay, like I get the message. Yeah. So, so, so individuals take their cue from their leaders, their managers, the culture. And that's why I think leaders are beginning to tune in much, much more to the fact that they are the owners, custodians, and shapers of the culture in which people yeah. operate. Yeah. Um, you see, the culture of the workplace doesn't rise above the vision of the leader. No, it does. And it's a, I, think, I think leaders are understanding that it's a deliberate strategy. It's, it's a very deliberate, conscious thing. Culture might be a, a few years ago might have been seen as, well, it's either there or it isn't or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, whereas I think now uh, leaders are saying, actually, we're, it's on us, this mm-hmm. culture thing. And, and how do we make it a deliberate execution mechanism of our strategy? So in other words, not just for the goodness of individuals and their development, but actually from the strategy and from the business and performance perspective, it's in our interests too uh, to shape culture and, and to create this environment where people can do their best work. And all so tied up within the ultimate engagement and the success of the organization, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a win-win, a win-win treason. Yeah. You have you've talked about it. There's never been a better time to be an employee with special skills or the right education, because these people can use technology to create and capture value. But the paradox remains. However, there's never been a more uh, precarious or concerning time to be an employee with ordinary skills, because computers, robots, and other digital technologies are replacing those ordinary skills at an extraordinary rate. So how do we seek to bridge that divide in Mm. reality, which is growing? Yeah, it's this Andrew McAfee uh, yes. talking about the rise of the robots and the implications of, you know, exponential technology, etc. Um, I think it was an interesting point and, and, and it resonates, doesn't it, with all kinds of other things because we see a great income divide as well between the kind of uh, those with that, those technical skills, those knowledge workers. And again, now we're looking at a wave of very sought after skills, the scarcity of talent and all of that. Um, meanwhile, it feels like we've been dumbing down uh, the, uh, uh, the recognition of, of, of lower grade work and, and also the, the barrier to entry into some of those kind of professional technical uh, career paths is, is, is concerning. People will talk about, well, you know, automation is going to take the drudgery out of jobs, etc. And that's great. And, you know, and I, I understand that argument. But actually, the danger with that is, is, is that, well, you're just making the bar even higher. So if computers are taking care of some of this middle work, then uh, how do I access the, the top work, if you like, from, from here, you know? Um, and how is the education system supporting that? And so I do believe, I would be an optimist generally, though, that uh, while jobs will, will be uh, compromised by technology, other jobs will appear. Our challenge, Teresa, is to make them accessible and to create pathways uh, for, for people with all kinds of backgrounds and skills um, and for ordinary work to be valued more um, to, to really challenge this you know, divide that says, actually, we've got to keep a lid on all that you know, low cost. Because when you, when you make it low cost, you're saying it's low value as well. And that's bringing things like mental health and uh, all kinds of other issues into society that, is this all I'm worth? Is this the best job I can get? Um, I think we have to challenge some of that. I think that divide is going to grow. You know, I mean, even, you know, in the past, I think you had the haves and the have-nots. And in in the 80s, 90s, we thought, well, education was made accessible to all. But I think really as that divide in with technology, et cetera, and with skills versus the unskilled, that that divide is going to come back with a greater, greater uh, force. Yeah, and that's... You know, we see, see the, 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 there will be the well-paid 
much sought after, highly skilled, and then there will be a, a glut down the bottom. And I think that is probably inevitable for a particular stream of work, which is, if you want to call it that sort of professional technical path, um, whereby, you know, it just feels that, you know, and we need those folks to, to progress. We need to pay them well. We need to sure. uh, make sure that they are rewarded for their great work, et cetera. But I think rather than try to break, break that particular stream necessarily because it's somehow bad, um, I think it's looking at all the other streams. It's this, this idea we talked about, about rebranding other forms of work and mm -hmm. repositioning them and making them equally valid and equally valuable um, and making sure that people see great meaning and upside in taking different career paths, not just this high-tech knowledge worker career yeah. path. That's not the only path. But it really needs to be articulated, though. It needs, it needs work. It needs mm -hmm. work to be worked on. And I wonder, will it be worked on? Will it be too late when, when it is articulated? Well, I think one of the... So, so I've mentioned the ESG uh, uh, developments. I think that's kind of positive from a corporate perspective. I think we have seen in the, even the last 20 years, we look at the disruptions that we've had. Um, and we had a, 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 the dot-com bubble burst a little bit in the early oh. noughties, and that caused a bit of disruption. We had a huge, big financial crisis, of course, in 2007, 8 to 10 or whatever. Now we have had COVID. So within this very short, within 20 years, we have yeah. had you know, yeah. these disruptions to the world of work. And we have automation and AI, et cetera, accelerating through all of all of that. So my, my, my hope would be is that we've seen enough um, what, what, what we see in, say, political terms, that the, the downside of all of this, and we look at the Rust Belt in the US, we look at Northern England, and we think of Brexit, and we think of Trump, yeah. and we think of all of these things, and uh, we kind of go, gosh, there is a societal uh, and a political and a destabling um, impact by not getting this right. If we allow market forces, if we allow market forces, if we allow things to go unchecked, um, then we're going to leave people behind. And those people that we leave behind are voters. And they do have a voice and they do have and they have shown their voice. And, and uh, I think, you know, so therefore, I think there's a self-interest in the political and in the corporation oh. to, to, to kind of get this to get this right um, so that we don't. The notion of the great reset that, that we, we hear so much about, it, it ties in with all of that. What is that great reset and how is it going to be? And the use of technology and its invasion into, into the privacy of lives. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's really getting at the heart of democracy in ways. Mm -hmm. And maybe government's interpretation of this COVID period and what's happening I think it's going to be a horse of a different color, what we come out with at the end, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, that would be my hope is that we we catch on to this, that we are we are we're in a we're in the um the sort of transition and this between 20th century models of work and 20th century norms in terms of education, corporate life, etc. And our 21st century life, right? Our 21st century yes. existence. I think we're somewhere in the middle and the transition there. And we're dealing with the sort of growing pains of, of what the 21st century is presenting to us in terms of democ de democratic, de democratized technology, yeah. access, globalization, interconnected connectivity around the world. We're still dealing with that. And we're, we're applying maybe in some cases, I think 20th century sort of solutions and models and norms still to what is a, a 21st century. There is, there is a fear it's going to get out of our reach, isn't it? Isn't there? There's a fear that it's going to get out of our control. Maybe we're thinking with the traditional mindset, but if it does get out of our reach, obviously the, uh, um, the masses will be subject to the um, planning of others for them. Yeah, and I guess the inevitable thing is if it gets a bit out of reach, it eventually then comes to a crisis point, doesn't it? So, yes. you know, and that's, I'm afraid, in Ireland, and I look back, I think we've been a very agile and resilient um, uh, country, generally speaking. But, you know, 
a lot of that has been relied on by the fact that we are so global and we if there's trouble at home we go abroad and we find work we we are resourceful that way um we have done amazing things as as a country but i guess my 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 hope would be that we would be more proactive in some of that agility rather than just being responding to crisis one crisis after another. after another so rather than let this divide or this um this this issue around the changing world of work rather than that that boil up into a crisis wouldn't it be crisis. nice to kind of take this opportunity of a pause in 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 that we that, that we've been you, forced you with to the book, being aware of what is ahead hmm. that's we it have people to prepare and that's where it all lies what is ahead I don't think we're fully aware, are we? Well, one of the one of the cycles, one of the 20th century norms that are not fit for purpose for us on the, that very issue is even the political cycle, in the sense of will a will a political party or a government take some of the tough choices that are required to challenge some of these traditional norms of work and all the infrastructure yeah. that goes with it, or will they let it go for another? another term, another part, you know, another, pass the buck on along. Yeah. So you do find sometimes, that that again, the short-term, short-term-ism is yeah. an issue for us individually. It's an issue for our companies. It's an issue for government. So yeah. that's why I'm, I'm kind of sort of calling for, I guess, in the, in, in the book, this sort of longer-term uh, view and maybe have a more sustained response, but so have the sort of civil service, if you like, and the, you know, the public, public bodies engaged on a longer term agenda no matter what the politician of the days are you know that, that there's an ongoing kind of transformation uh, yeah. that we all buy into um, and awareness and an openness to move on so really we're talking I, i'm coming on to another question about the disruption of work in past and is it any different to today it's not really any different so for the first time in the history of man, he's pitched against a rapidly advanced to advancing technology, automation and robotics. Would it be an exaggeration to say that man is now competing to retain his relevance in the workplace? I don't know. I, you, 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 you definitely you hear about this in the World Economic Forum and Charles Schwab saying the fourth industrial revolution absolutely changing the face of work and working life, you know, for uh you know for for the future and i i i get that and uh but i i don't i think we still retain control i still i still think i mean we're looking at some of the issues there with automation with ai and and you know driverless cars etc i i think ultimately we evolve um with the time too and the, what we don't know, uh, Teresa, what happens is the unknown consequences of all of this. So we find, for instance, that as we move towards automation and something, there's a, there's a need for a particular skill or a particular material or a particular innovation that drives a whole other industry around it that we didn't yeah. see, we didn't know it was coming. Well, so, the jobs of the future aren't born yet. They, yeah, exactly. Now, I, what, I, what I definitely can see, and I think this is probably... Uh, quite factual is the world of work has always changed and we have always adapted that is absolutely true my contention would be though that uh, particularly with uh, with digital and the exponential rise of technology not just linear ex uh, yeah. rise of technology we're probably facing a a faster rate of change um, and more frequency of change and disruption than certainly we have been used to in the 20th century. Sure. So as human beings and as institutions, we're struggling more to keep up than we would have had perhaps in, in previous cycles of, of other change. Sure. So hence my sort of you know, contention that it is different from that respect in that the adaptive qualities that we've always shown uh, but we've shown them more as reactive, responsive uh, qualities yeah. that we now need to bring those adaptive qualities to our, the front of our mind to be more conscious oh. and deliberate about yeah. what's going on sure. rather than just rely on our natural talent to respond. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, for me, if we applied that sort of idea of that strategic agility, if you like, rather than reactive agility, 
Um, and we apply that to education. We apply that to politics. We apply that to uh, the social uh, fabric that we have in terms of your know, unions and departments, etc. Um, uh, that I think I think we're in good shape to keep that control uh, rather than let the machines take over. I think there's a real job there for you in the future to get in your head in there in education and 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 um, you know bring it into that realm of thinking. Well, you know, and you you know, and you work with them, and I certainly do as well. And folks in DCU, and Trinity, you know, around the world too. There's a there are so many good people concerned about the same thing and trying to influence the system from within as well. So you know, I'd be very helpful as well. Like like I'm very hopeful about the next generation of leaders being more aware of some of this stuff. I'm also very hopeful for the next generation of educators too that that uh, they'll also you know make these changes. Mainly. It's about getting the right people with the right mindset in the right, At the right time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I love the word zoomification. What's going to be the outcome of all of this zoomification? We yeah. really do. It would be lovely to meet you in the flesh, but you mm-hmm. know, we can meet like this on Zoom. What do you think the outcome is going to be? Are we going to go for more a hybrid type of work, work uh, life balance? That's definitely true for those for those organisations and those roles and types that are that are that for where that's possible. Obviously, we can't forget about the huge cadres of jobs and roles where that isn't possible. Whether it's front frontline health workers or whatever, or your post postman or whatever it is is that yeah. there's a there's a bunch of jobs. And again, comes back to my point that we must not forget those roles in this. You know, so. I know I'm talking to a lot of organizations too, and they're talking about their new hybrid world of work and their new flexible work offer to those who can sort of you know, get the balance in their working life, et cetera. And they're going to accommodate that going forward. And that's brilliant. But the, the danger is, in the, and I think most of them are aware of it, they are aware of it, is that we don't leave people behind in that and feel under, you know, that they're being left out of that. Um, so flexibility in work is more than just where we work. It's also about how we work, um, what we do, you know, when we work. So, so I think we're looking, I think the Zoomification of work has prompted a debate on flexibility in general, not just about where we, we do our work. But there's no doubt. We're bringing it back to the work-life integration and playing to the four pillars of our lives, you know, your personal life, your work life, your community involvement, and your me time. Yeah. self-development yeah. Yeah. yeah so i'm going to wind it back <laughs> let's wind it back to asking the hard questions are we on a highway to prosperity or are we approaching a maze navigated only by the highly capable yeah it's interesting isn't it i think in the in the book uh is it martin ford is the quote you know where he talks about um that idea where um, making a world of um, that's that's has broad based security and prosperity for everyone mm-hmm. could be the biggest challenge of our time. Absolutely. Uh, and I think I was very struck by those words by you know by Martin Ford because just said it is a challenge and it's not going to happen by itself. And I think we're going to need a coalition of the willing to sort of make sure. That that gap doesn't get uh, larger, larger, and that we rebrand and we rethink work and we rethink what good work is. Um, and by the way, we talked about you know the privilege of of, of those with the knowledge workers and everything else. Life is not rosy for them either. I mean, you've you've seen, seen just this. What is it called? The nine six six? Was it the nine nine six? I can't remember from China talking about the six day week nine to nine 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 six. Um, yes. You know, um, so the, the 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 plight of the knowledge worker and the professional isn't all rosy either. Um, so so I think the reset is is for me is 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 definitely appropriate. And and I think maybe we've seen enough evidence. Sometimes as humans, we need to see evidence of things. And I think something like we've seen play out in immigration. We've seen it in the political, the, de- the democracy uh, situations in, in, in democratic uh, situations in the UK and the US and elsewhere. Um, I think this, surely they, these are wake up calls for, for people to understand that actually work and society and individuals, politics 
and work uh, and, and, and corporations, they're, they're tied. And in, indeed, of course, the climate too, climate change uh, choices. It's all enmeshed. Have. Yeah, it's all enmeshed. It's all, all part of the big picture. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we need to get it right for the individual. And, uh, and this is to, it. We need to prevent that divide. This is it, where I think maybe in the interests of, of growth and economic uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, prosperity, the the sort of the corporation and the financial element of the equation has probably been given a lot of attention. But it's interesting too when we make a choice globally, though, that we have a global pandemic. Suddenly, money is available. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly yeah. we find the so resources. What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So, so if we can respond in a pandemic the way we did, how, why can't we respond to other big issues of our day, whether that's climate or whether that's the world changing world of work? I think maybe COVID-19 was the, the uh, led to the operationalization of all of this, but really what the outcome is going to be is anybody's guess. It is, it is, and that's why I think back to your point about us taking control of it, though. I think we yeah. start to have to get more vocal about it and not just um, react to circumstances and take as, as, as given the rise in technology, the rise in companies, mm -hmm. the, rise, you know, the, the prevailing career paths of the past that they continue. I think we all have to kind of help here and say, actually, can we stop and challenge some of these assumptions about what good work is and about what uh, normal. And I think also what good education is. And I do believe that maybe rather, I, I don't wish to appear a traditionalist, but I think all dependence on this, it, it, premature or dependence on the screen does impact the formation of the brain, the growing child's brain and even levels of concentration, etc. There's a whole shift happening there that will have detrimental outcomes unless we control it. And digital literacy has to come as a number one. Yeah, I mean, one of the positive sides, again, it's positive, uh, negative side, it, the positive side is the access to education that's now available and for free <laughs> in many cases. So, so uh, technology has brought education and information to 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 the world and you know you don't have to go to harvard right yeah, to, you know, absolutely uh, but but on the other hand while there's no shortage of information probably there's a there's a war on attention you know mm -hmm. yeah a lot to do a lot to do teresa it, it has been brilliant talking to you let's do it again down the line i'll be watching this space and watching how you advance and no doubt you will leave your mark in this whole debate. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time, Teresa, and best of luck with your work too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.